won't be in it, but it will be filmed on me. No. Sure. I think they probably want to figure out how to ask. So whenever she's got that, we'll go. Oh, there you go. Well, it's 4, 4 to 18, so I don't know if we'll have any of us. We'll go ahead and get started. So the beauty of having two people is that it's even easier to be collaborative. Um, obviously, we spent some time together. So um, I like this meeting as much as discussion as anything else. Um, so I would say if people took the time to come over here, because they usually have a specific question or intention in mind. So I, my big goal for today is that if there's something that's giving you trouble or you want to talk about that relates to what we're talking about or otherwise, ask the back me. The more of a conversation will make the better. So the way I got this set up today is I've got kind of a little agenda, and again, I'm happy to kind of skew from it, but I, I like talking about just general injuries pertaining to golf that we see primarily in amateur golfers. So giving kind of a rundown on what we see, attributing that to kind of common reasons why. Uh, and then from there going to talking about several different exercises. Uh, some that are done kind of pre rounds, just more generalized stretches that I like is kind of appropriate warm ups, really more focused on injury prevention, but also a little bit on uh, ability to kind of generate more either club head speed or more consistency if that consistency is relating back to kind of a physical limitation. Um, so we'll kind of talk about uh, some of the TPI model stuff and how they look at what we call the body swing connection. So basically what can the body do and what can the body not do and how does that pertain to the golf swing. So the kind of general uh, analogy that I'll give a lot of times is like, you ask me to jump the basketball. Like that's how great on paper if you tell me you gotta run up, take a jump, and dunk it. Physically, I'm incapable of doing that. Same thing pertains to the golf swing. If the pro that you're working with giving instructions telling you you gotta get your hip turned back to get into this position on the load, but your hip is physically unable to turn it, then we've got a disconnect between what's being asked of you and you know what the body's capable of. So that's where I kind of see my role in the golf health world is being able to try to bridge that gap between what is appropriate and what we need to be able to physically do to achieve that, uh, you know, the overall goal of reducing risk for injury. Um, so we'll talk about some kind of warm up, go through some different treatment nuggets, and then I believe I also have on here, uh, not necessarily like kind of free golf stretches, but more generalized strengthening exercises that I think will also tie into some of the common reasons that we see people get hurt, to be able to do off the course for prevention. A lot of core strength and based stuff, and we'll talk through some specifics there. Uh, any questions so far? Perfect, well, I'll jump right into it. So I want to start with kind of that first picture where we have the golf swing and happy. Uh, I love this because it gives us an idea of what goes into the golf swing, but honestly, it's a lot. So starting off from the ground up, when we're looking at someone's ability to, you know, golf, we're looking at ankle motion. So specifically when I use the term dorsiflexion, basically how much can the ankles move? So specifically with the lead ankle, as we get into our backswing, and a little bit of the trail angle as we get into kind of our pivot. So we're looking at ankle mobility, specifically how flexible are the calves? Do they allow us to have the ankle motion that we need to be able to swing and not be encumbered by it? Moving up the chain, hamstrings. Hamstrings are one of the most kind of critical areas to be flexible, to be able to hit an appropriate golf shot. Now what I will tell people very commonly with the hamstrings is, there's one that's more important than the other. Are you both right-handed golfers? That makes it so much easier. So I'm gonna to speak to right-handed golfers only for those watching on the video. So the left hamstring is considerably more important as it pertains just to the golf swing than the right. It's not as much an injury-inducing mechanic as it is a performance mechanic. And I say that because the right hamstring doesn't take on significant slack because we are in a coil position as we get to the top of our backswing. Where we need good hamstring flexibility is in the lead hamstring as we get to our downswing at really the maximum point of impact. And the reason for that is to be able to stay down on the golf ball rotate the hips through. As we rotate through, we're clearing that hip backwards, ideally without standing up too early. So if we are tight in that lead hamstring, 
that is going to cause someone to what we call early extend or get the hips lifted too soon. It's a wide open club face for that right hand golfer. It's that right side of kind of push. Uh, if we're lucky, push hook, but it's, it's going to be an open club face. So I hear very frequently, I am um, first three, two to three holes, I'm really pushing the ball. As I warm up and loosen up, I'm able to kind of get back to the center club face. Frequently when that's the case, it's because the hamstring starts to stretch out a little bit because most golfers aren't getting the course, spending 15 minutes for the hip balls, working on stretching and mobility. So one of the, I would say, three to four most important muscle groups to be able to stretch prior to playing is your lead hamstring. Now, I, I would encourage everyone to stretch both sides. We want a healthy individual, not just on the golf course, just in all phases of life. But it's a really common swing flaw that happens where we stand up too soon. And it's another one of those ones where it's like being dunk in basketball. If you, if I ask you to touch your toes and you get to here, well, then trying to stay down on a wedge is just not gonna happen because you don't physically have the capability of staying down and clearing the hips through. So we're either gonna not rotate and it's gonna be basically all arms trying to cast it. Heard that one before? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> or we're going to stand up on it and that's that really thin, thin shot we hit. Thin or kind of push shot that we hit. So if any of that sounds familiar, leading hamstring is what I would start to look at. Now, a pretty quick and easy way to try to get an understanding of how flexible our hamstring is, if you have a goniometer, is to see, can we achieve at least 70 degrees with our legs straight? So, if we are laying down, basically with assistance, I would want to be able to get to at least 70 degrees. Now, ideally, I would be a little bit more flexible, but I'm at least past the 70 degree mark, which is about right here. I have plenty of people that I see that can't cross 45 degrees. So that's something that I would immediately start by looking at. The other way we can try to assess it is by pulling our knee back and then slowly kicking our foot up, and basically seeing are we able to get within 15 to 20 degrees of full extension of the knee at 90 degrees of hip flexion. The other fair way to assess that is just, we think of it as the standing toe touch test. However, the thing that I think is important about this is I'm a great example. When I lock out my knees, I probably should be a little better. I can basically get to my toes with a little coaxing. But if you look at when I take my left foot out of the equation and I just do my right foot, I can touch the ground with no issue. When I do just the left side, I basically get to where I was before. So the big flaw with checking to see how flexible my, ham my hamstrings are and checking both at the same time is, is that we're only going to be as flexible as our tightest hamstring. Now, in a perfect world, I would be a lot more flexible on my left when I'm demonstrating this in public. But that's a good way to be able to just gather a baseline and knowing, all right, well, this is a really important performance one to be able to kind of hit the golf ball the way I want to consistently because I have the capacity to. Okay, any questions with that? So I want to kind of move up the chain a little bit and start to talk about the hips. Now, I started by talking about kind of lower back pain. The Is hips. there exercise we're doing here, or? I got a whole, okay. whole, whole lot of them. So, the, basically the back side of the page we've got, I've got exercises that we'll get into. So I'll kind of make the, I'll give the why first, and then we'll talk through a list of what's okay. next. Because uh, I, I promise I got plenty of those. Uh, so, I mentioned lower back pain. This is kind of the just far away the most important part because about 64% of amateur golfers will kind of miss time from golf or hold off from playing golf at some point in their amateur golfing career because of lower back pain specifically. No problem other than lower back pain. So two and three, which is a crazy number, right? Like two out of three amateur golfers are gonna have low back pain from golf at some point in their golfing career. So if we can identify the factors as to why, then we have a lot better chance of lowering that number. So TPI did a study and basically looked at the kind of correlating risks to which golfers are more prone to having it. And the number one, there's two things that came back as kind of the most important predictive factors. One being how long can you hold a side plank? So we'll talk about that a little bit, but basically 
How strong are my oblique muscles on the side of my ribs? Those are the ones that rotate my core. Makes sense why that's important with protecting a lower back during a rotational activity. So we'll talk about that a little more. But to me, the more important one is the trail hip internal rotation. So for right-handed golfers, we're talking about our right hip. So as I sit back, if my leg is straight, if it rotates out to the outside, that's external rotation. If the toes rotate to the inside, that's internal rotation. So it's gonna look the exact opposite when my feet are fixed on the floor because my leg stays still, but my pelvis rotates with a stable leg. So internal rotation in a golfer on their trail side is basically how much rotation can we get in this back hip? Which makes sense because if we don't have the capacity to be able to rotate our hip back, trail hip backwards, instead of getting to here, we are gonna do this. So you're gonna see this golfer that sways and the only place to go from here is to slide. And so if I turn around and you see what that looks like from behind, instead of being able to get here and get the weight forward and clear through, where I stay down through this angle, I am going to be here and then here. So the high predominance of injury for a right-handed golfer is their right lower back. Because every time we get to this position where we are now kind of the reverse spine angle and we've done that, we create a kind of pinch and crunch within our lower back. So it's very common to get these kind of sharp, stabbing, back-type injuries. And in the worst case scenarios, we see some disc injuries that are created that way because not only are we side-bent, but we're also side-bent and then rotated, which is kind of the worst position for our discs. So the ability to get good mobility in our trail hip is probably the most important thing that I, I kind of, when I give these talks about golf, that I want people to come away with is if I can get better mobility in my hips, it is gonna take my game to the next level, but more than anything, it is gonna make me uh, significantly less susceptible to developing lower back pain, which is, again, you can start a PT practice based solely on lower back pain because of how prevalent it is, especially in the golf community. So the ability to rotate, we talked about internally, to me is most important because of how highly it's correlated with injury. The ability to rotate externally is also important, but more for performance reasons. Because if my trail hip is turned in at the beginning, that means that this hip is turned out. So basically, if you think of the angle from my belt buckle relative to my back hip is basically here, and compared to my front hip is here. Now, the reason that's less important is because a healthy hip normally has about 40 degrees of ability to turn in, and 60 of ability to turn out. So we've got about 20 extra kind of wiggle room uh, degrees to be able to have for that lead hip as we get to our backswing. So it's very rare that that limits it. And then as we go to our follow through, it's great to have great, good hip mobility, but we also have a lot of different ways to account for not having that. Whether that be being able to kind of spin your feet, you know, do the Scotty Scheffler where we get some creative footwork, creating space, or, you know, even, Further back, you'd see guys swing and step through because you don't have to have as much of that external mobility. So there's a lot of different ways to get around it, and it's a lot more rare that that impacts the swing. But again, for making kind of healthy, well-rounded people, I gotta talk about it a little bit because it's important for other factors, like putting on shoes and socks. So if you can't get your shoes and socks on, it's hard to play golf. So we'll put that one in the semi-important category. Okay, now kind of working up we talked about a little bit, uh, I'm gonna come back to the wrist elbow. So I'm gonna come back to the anatomy picture. So as we kind of go up from the role of the hips in the golf swing, we then kind of get to think about the lower back. So I mentioned it a little bit, but what I, the way I really approach the lower back when it comes to the golf swing is, it is the one that tends to pay for the sins of areas that are deficient otherwise. So. The main role of our lumbar spine is to be able to flex and extend. We get a little bit of side bending through there, but ideally in a perfect technique golf swing, we're not doing a ton of flexing or extending or side bending. We shouldn't be. So therefore the lower back shouldn't be very active as far as the movement generated. It should be stable so that 
the areas that do move are hips and then what we call our thoracic spine. So basically the 12 vertebrae that go from the last rib right about here to the top of our neck. That's the part of our spine that, that handles about 70% of the rotation. So in a perfect golfer, we are gonna have really loose but strong hips. We're gonna have a stable core that we don't move a whole lot. And then moving up the chain, we have really good rotation in our thoracic spine. Probably should have brought a golf club, but I'll, I'll demonstrate without one, looking just at the plane of my shoulders. Because as we think about what we wanna be able to have for rotation, with sitting forward with your feet and uh, knees pointed forward, we want to be able to rotate at least 60 degrees. So if we think about what we just talked about, we want to be able to get 60 degrees without doing this where I'm leaning. So we're staying tall and upright and rotating because if we then correlate 40 degrees here and 60 degrees here, we're able to get at least 90 and you know, great, perfect, we're all closer to 100 degrees of shoulder turn relative to our starting point without having to kind of get outside of our framework by dipping the shoulder down and back. So as we kind of review through that, we want to see flexible ankles, a loose left hamstring, a flexible trail hip, both hips but especially the trail hip, strong stable core, specifically looking at our oblique strength because that's the one that through studies has correlated with most kind of prevalent injuries. And then we wanna see a really mobile thoracic spine that's able to rotate both ways. Primarily though, more important towards the backswing. So the common theme we're hearing here is, if we can get someone loose to get 